Hi, I'm Jared from JTech Workshop, which you're currently watching right now. Did you know each year millions of computers are sent to the e-waste pile? These computers, which were once loved by their owners, now go neglected and are considered trash. With no value left, it's out with the old and in with the new, and these computers are sent to a cold, dark death. But with your help, these computers can power on once more playing your favorite classic PC games, running a media server, or even providing internet access to those less fortunate than yourself. So please, if you see a laptop out in the cold with no power supply, open your heart and your home and bring it inside. You may not be able to save them all, but if a computer can play the Windows startup sound just one more time, you've made a difference. What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. And if it's your first time, Welcome. Now imagine you're in a room full of laptops that are destined for the e-waste pile. All you see are old crappy Dell and HP machines, but something catches your eye. You reach out for it, pull it off the shelf, and you almost drop it because it's so heavy and it caught you off guard. You take a look at the brand on top and it's not anything you're familiar with, something called Sager. You only have a moment to look it over and decide to rescue it from the e-waste pickup that's on its way. It's only until you get it home that you find out what you actually got. When I found this laptop, I knew I had something special, but I had no idea how special it really was gonna be until I looked up the model number. Searching for the model number D900T immediately shows up a bunch of Alienware laptops that look shockingly similar to this one. After some more digging, I found out that this is a rebranded Alienware, or actually the Alienware is a rebranded laptop of this one. This model came out in 2005 and features a full desktop grade Pentium 4 clocked at 3 GHz. It has an NVIDIA GO 7800 and 4 RAM slots. 16 year old me would have killed for this kind of hardware. No, no, I really mean it. I would have, I would have killed somebody to get a computer like this back then. If that was an option, I, I would have done it. I was still on the Dell Dimension at that time, the one you can see here. Using the Wayback Machine, I found the Alienware Configurator page from 2005 and was able to spec out this exact machine and it came to about $4,000. And if anyone has an issue with me calling it an Alienware, I don't care. It might as well be one and it's way more interesting than calling it a Sager. There we go. Before diving into this machine, I had to make sure it worked. Thankfully, I found the power brick nearby which by my estimations is the actual size and weight of a real brick. The power supply uses this four pin connector and even though it's kind of keyed, it's still possible to put it in upside down. I know this because I did and I got smoke out of it and I thought I fried the laptop before I even got a chance to use it. Thankfully, it still worked. The first thing I noticed upon turning it on was the screen has all these lines going through it. It's a bit of a letdown and some searching shows that these aren't very common and I'd have to pay a lot more than I wanted to for a defect free one. So for now, I'll just deal with this and use an external monitor. Now that we know there's life, I needed to figure out the hard drive situation. This uses a proprietary cable to connect two hard drives to the motherboard. And of course this is missing along with the cover. After some hard searching, I found pictures of what the cable looks like, but I could not find the cable for sale anywhere. Worried I wasn't going to be able to make this work, I realized there were two CD-ROMs and I wondered if I could get an adapter to put in there. A quick eBay search and $14 later and one was on my way. Before we go any further, let's take a tour of this beast and give it a solid cleaning. The top is simple and understated, unlike its twin alien brother, though I like the style of the Alienware because it fits the time period. 
Along the front edge, you can see some speaker grills and a digital clock that sits in the middle flanked by media controls. On the left side, you'll find most of the ports you'll be using, and this thing is not lacking at all. The right side has two DVD ROM bays, one of which will be turned into a SATA drive adapter. The back also has plenty of ports, including some serial and parallel ports and various video outputs. Now the bottom is where you can tell something really special is happening here. There's fans everywhere on this thing. At full blast, we might be able to use this as a hovercraft. Everything you could want to get to is easily accessible through these panels. Taking a look inside, it's a simple layout. The trackpad is pretty small by today's standards, and the keyboard is a simple no-frills unit that feels decent to type on. The 17-inch screen is very glossy, and is a huge pain to keep clean and get rid of the glare. Along the top, you'll also see a nice little webcam. Now, I need to stress how large this laptop is, and laptop is a relative term here. You wouldn't want to do a whole lot of traveling with this tank. You can see it compared to a MacBook Air for a sense of scale. This thing is huge. The screen is as thick as the entire MacBook. Okay, with the tour out of the way, it's time to clean it up and dig a little deeper into the components inside. This laptop looks like it was well used, but it's not in bad shape. So normal cleaning wipes took care of everything that wasn't an actual scratch. Back to the bottom of the case, I need to remove these covers to clean the fans out and take a closer look at the components inside. I'll start with this panel that has the RAM slots. I was surprised to see four slots here, and they have their own dedicated cooling fan. This had two 512 megabytes and two 1 gigabyte sticks for a total of three. This panel near the bottom has our CPU, which is hidden by this huge heatsink. Seriously, this thing weighs a ton, and it's super easy to remove. It even tells you which screws you need to take out to remove it, and it has this handy little uh, handle built in. With that removed, you can see the full socketed desktop grade Pentium 4 chip. Next is the battery. This one has these three flathead screws holding it in. It's a large battery, but even when new it only gave over an hour of actual use. I'd be surprised if it has any capacity left today. This top left panel has the video card, and like the CPU, it has a very large heatsink on top with helpful instructions on how to remove it. This is an NVIDIA GO 7800, but I read you can put up to a 7950 in it, but my limited searching for those turned up nothing. Okay, it's time to get this cleaned up and ready to go. I used an old paintbrush to get the dust off the fans and turned to the GPU heatsink. This wasn't too dirty, just some light brushing was needed, then I replaced the thermal paste after scraping off the old stuff. I read that this could have been configured with up to a 3.8 GHz Pentium 4 when buying it originally, and I realized I just so happened to have a 3.8 GHz in another system, so I got an idea. I dropped in the CPU, applied new paste, and put the heatsink back on. After buttoning it back up, it was time to see if that CPU would work. Thankfully, it booted right up, and it was time to see what this computer can do. This machine originally came with XP, but to save myself the headache of trying to deal with XP in the modern times, I decided to just put Windows 7 on it, which installed with no issues. Now that it's up and running, I noticed there's one major issue with cramming this level of hardware into such a small package. It's loud. Like, really loud. And this is what it sounds like just sitting here doing nothing. I can't wait to hear what it sounds like when it's actually doing some work. 
For testing, I'm gonna throw 3D Mark 06 at it, along with your standard Half-Life 2, Doom 3, you know, the normal stuff from that time period. I'll top it off with some Far Cry 2. Ha, I bet you thought I was gonna say Crisis, not this time. Far Cry 2 will be a good example of what you could expect a couple years after the machine was out and see how your performance held up over time. I'm gonna be running to an external monitor so I don't have to stare at all those lines on the screen and it'll just make it easier overall. And I'll be running it at the native 1280 by 1024 resolution. I started with 3D Mark 06 to see how it would handle it and it definitely struggled through the testing, with single digit sections being pretty common. The CPU test was a joke, with a monstrous zero FPS. The final score was 3,354 3D Marks, which is about a third of the score of the Alienware desktop I rebuilt recently. I decided to give another chance to score well with 3D Mark 03. This did a lot better, crushing most of the tests and came out with a score of 13,463, which to my surprise absolutely stomped the Dell Dimensions score of 7,390 that I upgraded in a previous video. After these two tests, I got a good idea about the max noise level, and it isn't much different than the regular idle noise level, so I guess that's good. Don't get me wrong, it's not quiet at all, but it doesn't get much louder under load. I can't get any temperature monitoring programs to pick up anything on this machine, but I can tell you the GPU vent is very hot, and the wrist rest directly above it is borderline uncomfortable for actually playing on. An external keyboard would be a must for extended playing. Half-Life 2 ran very well as expected and I had no issues with native resolution and medium to high settings. Doom 3 also ran great. Medium settings at native resolution kept it at a steady 60 FPS for most of the time. A few rare drops here and there, but it didn't affect gameplay. For Far Cry 2, I just ran the built-in benchmark, and it actually struggled pretty bad here, only scoring an average of 22 FPS with a max of 35. For one last game, I also decided to throw Oblivion on there, and found I had to lower the settings as well as the resolution to get it to run decently, but you could definitely play it with no issues. I did a little web browsing and, you know, it was okay. YouTube was slow as expected, and there was no way you could play any videos back in HD. You know, it wasn't too long ago when a gaming laptop was considered an oxymoron, really only coming into their own when the Nvidia 10 series cards came along. Before that, you were paying a huge premium for inferior components compared to their desktop counterparts, all for the sake of portability. But this laptop was different. Sure, you're still paying a huge premium, but you were getting desktop level hardware and everything was upgradable. Well, to an extent. And it was portable. Just make sure to lift with your knees before you pick it up. Alienware always had this stigma back in the day, and even today to some extent, of being overpriced for what you got. But I can guarantee you that if you showed up to a LAN party with this back in the day, people would have been drooling. I know I would have. I'm glad I was able to save this laptop from a sad death. It doesn't deserve the same fate as those latitudes and thinkpads. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Make sure to like and leave a comment down below, and if you enjoyed it, consider subscribing. I'm super close to that thousand subscriber mark and could use all the help I could get. And with that being said, I'll catch you in the next one.